to Mark chapter 16. And we will be reading verses 9 through 20. Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the same residue, Neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So that after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to this time now in our service where we open your word and we desire to study it, to know it, so that we might further understand you, our Lord, and so that we might further understand your revealed will for your people. And so we ask now that as we read and hear the word preached, that you would work in us by your spirit so that the word would have the right effect on us. We know that we as believers can be dull of hearing. We can be hard-hearted at times. We read in your word of your disciples, for the disciples of Jesus who at times did not receive what he said because even though they were believers, they had hardness of heart, the apostles. And so we, we pray that you would soften the heart, open the eyes, open the ears, and apply your word now to each one for your glory. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good, to, uh, good for us all to be gathered this morning together, amen? As, uh, it's hard to believe, isn't it, that uh, we, we've come, to the, come the, to the Lord willing today, the, uh, the conclusion of the Gospel of Mark. And um, I don't know if we all realize this or not, but, um, you know, since we've been here in December of 2017, think of that for a moment, brothers, we, we've been here a while. Boy, we've seen some children born, amen? We, we've seen all kinds of things that the Lord is doing, and um, it's just a wonderful thing. And it's, it's, you know, as I studied out this last portion of the scripture this uh, last couple of weeks, it's, it's kind of like there's an old friend that's leaving, <laughs> amen? Because we've seen and been blessed in so many ways, brethren, with this gospel. You think for a moment from chapter 1, the very opening of the gospel. We have seen so many amazing things concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. As he uh, walked here as perfect God-man, the perfect God, the perfect man, that, 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 that existence together. Is just a most amazing thing for me to behold and understand. It's 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 an amazing thing, isn't it? We saw him raise the dead. We saw him calm the storm. We saw him heal the lepers. We we just have seen the Lord Jesus do so many many things, and it really is an amazing thing. And up to this point, brethren, 
we have, you know, from chapter 1 right up till verse 8 where we ended last week, last Lord's Day morning, all of us have sat here and said, yes, we have believed every word of God. We have believed that every word that we've read, everything that we've studied, everything that we've looked at has been the word of God. Amen? I don't think there's anybody here this morning that would say up to this point, it's not the word of God. And this morning as we continue, uh, I, I, I hesitate. I have struggled greatly with, uh, with even opening up this can of worms um, because it's an amazing thing, brother, is God has preserved his word down through the ages and annals of time. Let me just say this. I'm going to just kind of with, you know, eight pages of my notes, just speak some things, really just some truths that we need to hear, I think, this morning concerning this verse. Many of us know, brother, that this verse, and many people believe today, and I'm going to state why I don't believe that, why I believe what we're going to read is the Word of God, and it has been in the text, and it has been in the manuscripts, and it has been preserved down through the annals of time. But there are some who really believe that this whole portion of Scripture, these 12 verses, shouldn't even be preached upon, which is quite an amazing thing when you think about that. And it's from people who I love and who I followed and who I admire. Um, so let me just say this this morning as we get started. To me, there is a big difference, brother, between saying, and, and really it's, the, you know, the theology, the, the terminology that we, we talked about this morning, right? Textual criticism. What, what does that mean? Textual criticism doesn't mean that people are criticizing the Bible. <laughs> Many times they'll say, oh, you're criticizing the Bible. No, they're not criticizing the Bible. What they're doing is, brother, it is a way in which you realize we have thousands of manuscripts, thousands of them, brother. And textual criticism simply means that we look at the manuscripts that we have, and we study them, and we try and put together what was actually being said. What, what did they want to say? What did they want to speak? What were they saying here concerning this? That's a needful thing. This is a most... A delicate thing. You have wise men over the annals and the ages of time who have done this. And this is why we have what we have. Amen. We believe, go on our website, we believe that the autographs, you know what the autographs are? The autographs were the original writings as God carried them along by the Holy Ghost, that they were inspired by God. We don't have those anymore. In fact, Brother Mark this morning said, and I certainly concur and agree to the, to the nth degree with him, that if we had the originals, you know what we'd all be doing probably? We'd be worshiping them. We'd be bowing down. You're saying, well, that's crazy, Mike. Okay, let's go to Numbers 20. We can't go there, but go to Numbers 21. You remember the snake on the pole, yep. right? You remember that. They, they, they murmured against God and... Snakes came and started to kill the, the children of Israel. And God told Moses, you get this snake. In fact, Dr. Mark back there, they still use this. It's an amazing thing, that picture of the snake on a pole. And Moses said, hey, if the snakes come, look and live. You look up there and you won't die from that. You realize, brother, 800 years later, listen, 800 years later, the nation of Israel was worshiping that thing. It's an amazing thing. How about Gideon's ephod? Look at that, brother. You, you think men won't veer off and worship a, something they shouldn't be worshiping? Oh, yeah. Beautiful ephod made. God used it for his glory. And it wasn't long, and the people of God were worshiping an ephod. It's a stunning thing. So I concur completely. I would concur completely with that, that I believe, yes, if we had the original writings, the autographs, we would all be bowing down. We've had it. We'd had them up. We we we'd have them underneath our little, you know, pulpit up here, and we'd have them in every other church. Kind of like, listen, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying, right? I mean, we have people nowadays who are worshiping the alleged fingers of Peter. <laughs> it's a stunning thing. It really is. But I want you all to know this morning, as we are gathered here, that I believe that the 12 verses that we are about to rip into that we're going to conclude with this morning, is and are the preserved word of God. The autographs were inspired. 
the manuscripts that we have through textual criticism, brothers, through the study of them. God has preserved for us what we should have right here in our hands. Now, there's a difference, and let me say this as we move along. There's a difference between this, the manuscripts, the streams, if you will. Okay? Up until the early 1800s, this text was not even a discussion. It was not. Nobody ever thought or said this text shouldn't be in here. Nobody did. Until the early 1800s when Vaticanus and Sinaiticus were found. Two manuscripts who were written in the 4th century, and actually there was a third one that was found with it as well, that was written in the 12th century. Those manuscripts do not have Mark, or Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. And this is what's happened now. It's one thing to say, I see this stream of manuscripts that were found, and it doesn't have it. Okay, I, I get that. I understand that. There's nothing evil in that. There's nothing sinister in all of that. There is something evil and sinister, though, when you say that this should not be in the canon, which is what some of our brothers have said. And I know for a fact I talked to Trent. I talked to Trent, and he said, I bet our brother wishes he could take that back, and I believe he does. I believe he would take that back if he could. So this morning, as we're here in our in our text this morning. Again, there is so much history. There is so much textual criticism that has taken place. Look, I'm a little blip right here in history. That's it. That's it. We're, we're a blip. Men who have studied this and earnestly, have earnestly tried to do the right thing. Amen. And again, there are evil men who have taken away and added to the word of God. But there are men who have looked at this and said, we just don't believe it should be in there. I'm not one of them. I am not one of them. I will never be one of them. I'm not a rabid TR guy. Amen? I'm a received text guy. <laughs> Nobody even knows what that is. Scripts. Rabid TR people think that the King James Bible is the only one that can save people. I've had people tell me that. If you don't read that, you can't be saved. I got saved reading a what I would call today, and please don't take offense to this, to the non-inspired version, which would be the NIV Bible. Okay. I'm not saying it's, you know, you read the NIV, that's, that's up to you. I did. The Lord saved me in that. But I do believe that what we have here in our Bibles this morning, the words that we're about to read are preserved by God himself. You know, we can go in the Bible, brother, and we can look in Jeremiah chapter 36. We can go to many other chapters in the Bible to understand how we got our Bible and how God preserved it. Jeremiah 36 is a good one if you want to go there. <laughs> Remember that? Baruch, write this down, Baruch. It was written down. The king threw it in the fire and God said, oh, wait a minute here. No, write that again. I'm going to preserve that. This is how God has done it. Jesus himself references those Old Testament canons, those things that were preserved by God himself long before the church ever came along. We had the Old Testament preserved, brother, in the prophets. Amen? In the Psalms, Jesus himself says that. He, the Pentateuch, they're all preserved. Jesus himself references those. The New Testament is referenced on several occasions concerning those books that we are to have. We have, brethren, what God intended us to have. Amen? We have it this morning, and the words that we are about to, that we are about to delve into, clearly, clearly, are the words of God himself. I, Trent said one time, Trent, I keep bringing you up, but he said, I'm, I'm, Pastor Mike, I'm really glad that you work. Me too. <laughs> hey, I'm glad the Lord would give me the ability to work. Because working pastors do not have a lot of time to sit around and think up stupid things. <laughs> Sometimes people sit around and they, st they think up stupid things. Amen. Too much time on your hands. Good for the elders to work. Good for the pastors to work. Good to get into the Bible. Amen. Good to look at it and say, what is the Lord trying to teach us this morning? And so... With that being said, I'm going to jump ahead. 
I've got nine pages of historical notes here that I just said in about three minutes. Amen. Stuff that stuff that is is needful. Stuff that is 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 needful for us to understand the heuristicity of our manuscripts. But again, we should never take it to the level saying it shouldn't be in the canon, because you are then attacking the canon. Yep. If you say it's not in that flow of manuscripts, I get it, because it's not. I just don't like that manuscript. That's all. Amen? So let's turn in our Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 16. And again, hours and hours of study. I have studied this. Many brothers have studied it. I've spent so many hours studying this stuff. And um, I believe in my heart of hearts that the words we're about to read are God's preserved words. Amen. Look at verse number 9. Mark 16, look at verse number 9. The verse of the Bible says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Now, brethren, Mark immediately, in verse number 9, draws our attention to the word appeared. He says that Jesus appeared. This, of course, is the cornerstone, brethren, as we know, to the words written by Luke back in Acts chapter 1, which we looked at last week. You remember that. This is the foundation. This is the very rock, the very core, the very terra firma, amen, that, that we looked at last week that Spurgeon spoke about. He said this, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Now, Mark likes this word appeared, and so do I. Again, because this is a foundational thing to the gospel. We have seen from the very beginning the God-man in his hypostatic union as perfect God and perfect man, as I said, doing the things that only God could do. Men could not heal leprosy, brethren. Jesus simply stuck his hand out, touched him, and it was healed immediately. It's an amazing thing. Again, we see the God-man at his work. Well, look here now. He says, again, Mark loves this word, appeared. And this is foundational, brethren, to our text. Look at verse number 12. He loved this word. Look at verse number 12 there, if you would. Look what the Bible says. After that, he, what? He appeared. Amen. There's that word again. Look at verse number 14. Look at verse number 14. Look what the Bible says there. And afterward, he appeared unto the eleven. Mark is making a theological uh, and a biblical truth to his disciples. He's saying that the Lord Jesus Christ was dead for three days, like we looked at, amen. He was in the grave, and he rose up again. And you know what the proof, the foundation of his resurrection is that he appeared. Amen. He appeared to this person and that person and all sorts of things. In fact, that is the terra firma. Because if you notice, brother, there's a couple of other words that he uses in, right here in our verses together. That word appearing is the foundation of their belief. But look what uh, the Lord, look what the Bible says here in verse number 11. Mark 16, look at verse number 11. And they, when they heard that he was alive, had been seen of her, what? Believe not. He appeared, he appeared, he appeared. Look at the response. The Bible says they believed not. Look at verse 13. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed them, what? Not. The Lord Jesus here, of course, is affirming, as I said, he is affirming, which is going to come a little bit later in our text, which is really important to understand that. Belief and not belief. He says he appeared so that they might believe. They are sitting right now not believing. Look at verse 14. After he appeared unto the eleven, as they sat at meat, he upbraided them. He, he what would modern vernacular be? He ripped into them. Why? I've appeared, I've appeared, I've appeared. You believe not, you believe not. Look at what he says. With their unbelief, that hardness of heart, because they believed not. Again, brother, them which had seen him after he was alive. I like how one preacher put it. Unbelief is a bloody sin. Hebrews 10, 26. We don't have time this morning to look that up. He said it's a heavy sin 
John 3, 19. A most ungrateful and inexcusable sin. Such as shuts a man up as a close prisoner in the dark dungeon of the law under unavoidable destruction. Galatians 3, 23. It is an amazing thing, these infallible proofs. He appeared, he appeared, he appeared. That they might what? Believe. Look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me, if you would. This idea of appearing, this idea of being seen, this terra firma of believing in the resurrection, trusting in what Christ has done. Look there at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you would, with me this morning. Look at verse number 4. We know this scripture well. And he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was what? Seen of Cephas. He appeared uh, of Cephas, then to the, of the twelve. Look at verse 6. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. Now his, the terra firma, the belief, the understanding that he physically, bodily rose from the grave, this is how he's showing them and proving them. He's appearing. He appeared now to 500 of the brethren, more than 500 brethren all at the same time, of whom greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Look at verse 7. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Again, the terra firma, the belief, the understanding, the proof, the infallible proof that our Lord Jesus Christ did indeed rise from the dead. Look at verse 8. And last of all, he was saying of me also as one born out of due time. Brother, Mary was sovereignly chosen by God to be the first witness of his bodily resurrection from the dead. She is used by God as his instrument. Think of this for a moment. To go and tell the other disciples that he was indeed risen from the dead. Brother, again, belief. We have to keep reminding ourselves of this. Because he's going to address it in the text a little bit later on here. I rose from the grave. I appeared, I appeared, I appeared. I was seen by this. I was seen by above 500 of the brethren. I was seen here and I was seen there. He appeared, brother. Amen. To again cement the biblical truth. The biblical truth. That he did indeed rise physically from the grave. What an amazing thing the Lord would, would be so gracious to us. That he would by faith. He would open our eyes of faith. To see this. This is a miracle of God. You understand this brother. This is why you can't trick anybody. You can't trick anybody. It is a miracle of God to look at the text of Scripture and to say, I haven't seen him physically, but I what? I believe. What did he tell Thomas, remember? You guys have seen, blessed are they who believe and have not seen. That is a gift of faith by God alone. Man can't give it to you. I can't give it to you. I can't. I wish I could because if I would, you know what I'd do? You know all my family? I'd be knocking on their front door with a cup of faith. Drink this. Only God, only God can open the eyes of faith and have us look at this wonderful portion of Scripture and say, yes, I believe. What an amazing thing to think about for a moment, isn't it, brother? What a stunning thing for us to consider. Look back there now, Mark. Chapter 16. Look at here how Mark, as he is led by the Holy Spirit of God, look what he does for us here in this particular portion of Scripture. Look there, if you would, back at verse number 9. He says, Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first unto Mary, of whom he had cast out seven devils. Can I read that again? Of whom he cast out seven devils. Mark reminds us here, brother, of what kind of woman Mary was when she met the Lord Jesus Christ. She was a demon. Think of this, brother. 
She was a demon-possessed woman with seven devils. This is an amazing, stunning thing, brethren. The Bible tells us, does it not, that those who are forgiven much, we could quote it together, will what? Will love much. When you understand what Christ has done for you, <laughs> you will love him much because he first loved you much. This is the characteristic we see of Mary. She realizes and understands what Christ has done. Not one devil, not two devils, not three devils, not four, not five, not six, seven devils. He drove out of her. What an amazing thing we see, this loving, caring devotion of Mary. From the cross to the grave, and now as we stand together in the text this morning at his wonderful, amazing resurrection from the dead. Those who have forgiven much will love much. Look at Luke chapter 7. Look at Luke chapter 7. This is really the point of the gospel. This is really the, the, uh, the watershed of the gospel. Look at Luke chapter 7. Again, a very familiar portion of scripture to us all. We've read it before. We've heard it before. I want you to see the description that is given. Look at verse number 37. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner. You know you're a sinner this morning? I am. <laughs> behold, a woman who was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. Look down at verse number 39. She is uh, obviously worshiping the Lord Jesus. She's anointing him. Look at verse 39. Now when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him. For she is a sinner. Do you realize you're a sinner this morning? Boy, what a negative kind of guy. He's so negative. That pastor, he's so negative all the time. He's always talking about sinners and sin. <clears throat> when you realize what you were saved from, Amen. you will love him much. If you're here this morning, you think you haven't been forgiven much, you're not loving much. If you were possessed by seven devils and the Lord Jesus Christ simply spoke and released you from them devils, forgave you of your sins, you would love him much. When you get a hold of that, this is Mary's character. This is who she is. She understands that. Look now, if you will, as we read along there in our text here, and Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. Doesn't matter what you owe. You could owe a million pence. As, record, as, as, as realized in your sin. You could, you could owe all of that. You can't pay it back. Or maybe you think you're a good person this morning and you don't have very much sin. Well, he addresses you too. Look here. And when dad had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Look down at verse 47. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many. We all have many sins. We've all been forgiven. If you're saved this morning, you have had many sins. You are nothing but a reeking mass of sin. <laughs> right? No, today we think we're good, but no, the Bible doesn't say that anywhere. 
before Christ called you, you were guilty of the same thing I was. All six of those things in Romans chapter 3. Right? There's none that seeketh after God. None. Not one. There's none. Not one. For all have what? Sin. And come short of the glory of God. You have many sins. You are a slave to your sin. Look at this. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven. Listen. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth what? Little. When you realize your spiritual deadness. You are dead in your sins and trespasses. Dead. Because of what we're talking about this morning. Because of the text that we're reading this morning. Because of this biblical truth. That he rose from the grave and he appeared unto many. When you believe on him, your sins are forgiven. Your many sins. Look at verse 48. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. What an amazing thing, brethren. It really, really is. In fact, look at another passage. Look at 1 Timothy. Not only was that woman thankful, not only was Mary having a heart of thankfulness because of what Christ has done. Look at the Apostle Paul. Look here, if you would, real quickly at 1 Timothy chapter 1. Just want to give you a flavor for those who realize, and the Holy Spirit has made clear to them, the magnitude in which you have been saved from. Look here at verse number 12. 1 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse number 12. Paul breaks out into a song of thankfulness. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Again, Paul could not help himself but to look at the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I am so thankful for what he has done. What has God done for Paul? What does he say God did for him? Well, look at the next verse. This is why Paul breaks into thankfulness in this morning. Anybody who's been saved by God himself through Christ Jesus alone is thankful. Look at verse 13. Look at this wonderful gift that is given to Paul. He praises God for it. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained what? Mercy. He not only says that once. Look at verse 16. He can't help himself. God showed me mercy. He withheld Brethren, the stripes and the death that I deserved when he had the, the, the within the power to give it to me. That's what mercy literally means. He withheld it. I obtained mercy, Paul said. Look down there, if you would, at verse 16. How be it for this cause, I obtained what? Mercy. Paul never forgot that. He never forgot that. Not only did he obtain mercy... Look what he says in verse 14. He's thankful to God he obtained mercy. Look at verse number 14. Not only did he obtain mercy, look what he was given. In the grace of our Lord. Mercy and grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through his death, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel. When you believe and you trust in the gospel, this is what God gives to you through Christ. His mercy. His grace. Listen, brother. Is a merited favor. You did nothing to deserve it. And if you think you did this morning, you're still lost in your sins. His grace. Look what he says there. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save good people, to save people who think they're good? To save people who think they deserve it? No. To save sinners of whom I am 
chief. Don't be afraid to say the word sinner. Don't be like these devils, changing the songs. Amazing grace. You know what they've done? Remember? Remember what he said? Who saved a wretch like me? They've changed the hymns, brother. They've changed the wording. They don't want anybody to feel bad about themselves ever. He saved a, not a wretch like me. They changed it to a person like me. You're still a wretch. You still need God's mercy and his grace. Change the hymn all you want until you understand and realize the stunning work of Christ to save you from your sin. You don't think you need it. You need it. We see this, brethren, again in Mary. This was her heart of thankfulness. Just as Mary, just as the sinning woman, just as Paul and every true believer who loves the Lord Jesus Christ much. They love him because he first loved us much by forgiving us much. Amen? Look back there now at Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> Look what Jesus says here. The Lord Jesus Christ risen from the grave. He who appeared and appeared and appeared. He now says this to his disciples. Look there at verse number 15. First, or, uh, <clears throat> Mark 16, look at verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Lord Jesus here, brethren, as, he, as Mark brings his, his, his gospel to a close, he gives his disciples... Listen, his, this is important, brother. He gives to his disciples his divine recipe for church growth. Hey, you want some church growth? You want some biblical church growth? Right here, Jesus himself said, this is my divine recipe for church growth. It's an amazing thing. The Great Commission, brother is not, it's an amazing thing, a suggestion. Remember Ted Koppel? You remember him? I remember he was speaking one time at a college, and things were going down the toilet really fast. And he went in, and he was, he was speaking about the Ten Commandments. And he stands up before the liberal college students and says, these are not the Ten Suggestions. They are God's imperative commands. Listen, brother, the Great Commission is an imperative command. You and I don't have an option. Not at all. This is something that the church has done since this was uttered. Since the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. That's how the gospel spread so quickly. It's an amazing thing, brother, when you understand that. It's an it is an imperative command that every true believer, every true believer will participate in. You know why? Because every true believer knows that in this great commission of God, he has provided both the means and the ends of his purposes. The means are the preaching of the gospel. The true believer knows that. This is the means in which God uses. The ends then are what? God adding to the church daily those who should be saved. The true child of God knows this. The true child of God does not flutter around with the gospel. The true child of God doesn't put on pony, doggy and pony shows and sparks and foil, uh, name it. The true child of God does not do that because he knows this is God's. God's divine imperative command in which he uses by the means, the preaching of the gospel to build his church. Isn't that wonderful? We can all rest easy now, can't we? <clears throat> you know, Pastor Mike doesn't need to put a diaper on. Suck on a binky. Brother Dean coming in on a zip rope. 
Howard over here in a bathtub. Can you imagine that? No. We don't need any of it. I don't want any of it. I don't want to go anywhere near it. It stinks. It smells like this stinky pig-filled world. I want to be obedient to that which God commanded me to be obedient to. Go into all the world. Don't preach yourself. Don't preach some other man. You preach the gospel of Christ. Amen. God's means in bringing about his ends, which is the saving of his lost sheep. Man, I'm thankful this morning for that. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, turn there, if you would, with me for just a moment. Look at Acts chapter 1. This, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ right before he's taken up before their eyes. Now, look at verse number 7. They, they asked him in verse 6, Hey, are you, you going to restore the kingdom of Israel now? Are they still, they're still fluttering around a little bit. Verse 7. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times. You know what that means, brother? It is not for men to know the duration of time that this is all going to happen. The church age. How long is the church age going to go on? Jesus says, it's not for you to know. It's, it, it's not your concern, brethren. It might go on 100 years. It might go on 1,000 years. It might go on 2,000. It might go on 3,000 years. Don't concern yourself with that. God is sovereign. He'll concern himself with how long this is going to go. Look at the second things. Don't worry about the times or the seasons. Well, those seasons, that refers to the events that take place within the times. You, right now, brethren, are in a season, in God's time. 2,000 years past the cross, and here we all are, in this event, in this season, in this time. God says, hey, don't worry about that. Don't think about it. You know what he tells them to worry about? Look what he says. Times and seasons, don't worry about it. There's only one main concern you should have. Look what he says. Verse 8. Well, let me just finish the sovereign of God in that verse. The seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, that's his own authority, his own sovereignty. He swirls the earth and holds it together as long as he's going to do that. Look at verse 8. Jesus says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses rather in the church this is what we are to be doing we are to be witnesses of what of his death his burial and his resurrection the gospel where are we to be witnesses at well god left no stone unturned here look what he says so we witnesses to me both in jerusalem let me ask you this where's your hometown right here. We got some brothers that live in Sioux Falls. That's Brother Mark and his family. That's their hometown. You be witnesses in your hometown. We are to be witnesses here in Bismarck, North Dakota, where God has placed us in our season, in our time. Not only are we to be witnesses there concerning the resurrection. Look at where else he says. Look at the second place. In an old Judea. Well, Judea means a little bigger area, it would be like our counties. I live in Burley County. I'm going to be a witness in Bismarck, North Dakota, and Burley County. That's where I'm supposed to be a witness. But he's not done there. Not only in our city, not only in our county. Look at our state. Look what he tells them. In an all Samaria. That's the state of North Dakota. We are to be witnesses in our city, in our county, and in our whole state where God has us. And then he says this, Brother Dean and some of the other uh, missionaries that go out into the world is here, 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 and now here and to the uttermost of the earth. We are to proclaim and to be witnesses of what we are reading here this morning in our town, in our county, in our state, and in our world. You know why? Because the true believer knows this is God's means. The Great Commission. 
which is not an option. It is an imperative command given by God to go into your town, into your county, into your state, and into the world with this wonderful, amazing message of Christ dying, raising, going to the grave, and raising again from the dead. The true believer knows that's the power. You want to know why? Wait, Mike, his head just spins around, and he just, you know, every week he's talking about this. Every week. It should be on our hearts and on our minds, the preaching of this gospel, because God will bring in his sheep, his lost sheep, through the preaching of his word. Look back there at Mark 16. Look at verse number 16. Mark 16, look at verse number 16. He lays out the commission to them, and then he says this. Look at verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. The Lord Jesus here, do not be confused. He's not teaching baptismal regeneration. Don't be confused. We're going to look at the main focus point of what saves and what doesn't saves in this text. That's why the ones before were important, 11, 14, 13. The Lord Jesus gives us a combined promise of salvation and a dire warning. We notice immediately, don't we, brother? That Jesus did not say condemnation belonged to the one who was not baptized. <laughs> Read it carefully, brother. Only to the one who does not what? Believe. Believe. He does not tie condemnation to baptism. He ties it to unbelief. He places the emphasis on believing. He says that condemnation rests on disbelief, not on baptism. Brethren, salvation rests solely on belief. Jesus, again, is not teaching in any way baptismal regeneration whatsoever. But rather he is affirming. Listen, brother. He is affirming the foundation. He is affirming the terra firma. He is affirming the belief is what saves. Believing in the death, burial, and resurrection is what saves. He ties it right back to verse number 11, verse number 13, and verse number 14. And he also ties it to John chapter 3. Let's go there. Look at John chapter 3. He's telling the disciples earlier in the Gospel of Mark that your unbelief is condemning you. It's not your baptism, it's your unbelief. I have news for you. If you don't believe, you're not going to get baptized anyway. Look at John chapter 3. The Lord Jesus here is being very consistent. He wrote the Word of God, and he's very consistent with what he's te taught throughout the Word of God. Look at verse 16. We know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever, what, believeth, we could get into that word, not today, it's already five after. In him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Look at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not what? Condemned. Your condemnation is tied to what you believe about Christ, about his death, burial, and resurrection. That's what it's tied to. It's tied to that. Not to baptism, not to crawl on some stairs, not to whipping yourself, not to doing anything. There's no work you can do. It's tied specifically to what you believe concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what condemnation is tied to. It's never tied to baptism. It's never tied to the Lord's Supper. We're going to gather here in a minute. Condemnation, the only condemnation is that there of a brother who eats it in an unworthy manner. This is talking about spiritual death. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. The Lord Jesus here is simply stating a fact. You know, back in verse 11, back in verse 13, back in verse 14, when I upbraided you for your unbelief, this is what unbelief does. It condemns you to hell. It separates and sends you straight to hell. It's an amazing thing, brother. Not only John 3, 16, 
But listen, hundreds. Take my glasses off. Hundreds of verses in the Bible that say we are saved by believing alone. Don't add, brother. We talked this morning in, some, in the Bible study. Don't add to the word. Don't do it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 16. Remember that guy, the jailer? Remember him? He asked a wonderful eternal question. There's so many eternal questions in the Bible. It's an amazing thing. He comes running in, remember? Acts 16, 31, 32. Remember that verse? He comes ripping in there and falls on his knees. He didn't say, where's the pool of water so I can get baptized? Where's the sprinkling of water so I can get baptized? He asked this wonderful question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Listen. Believe. Believe. Trust. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be what? Saved. Brother, the condemnation in this passage has nothing to do with water. Nothing. It has to do with your faith, where your faith is at, who you've trusted in, and what you think of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. Now look back there quick. Ooh, yeah, it's 10 after. Look back here at Mark. We'll finish this up, Lord willing. Look at Mark chapter 16. Look at verses 17 and 18. Let's just... <clears throat> And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. Yeah. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Verse 18. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, listen, it shall not hurt them. Did you guys see that? I don't want to get sidetracked. I, I hate to get sidetracked on this. Did you guys see that debate with White and Durbin with those two atheists? And he had that cup of antifreeze in his hand. Did you guys happen to see that? Oh, you got to go look it up. This, this atheist hates God like you can't believe. And his only test is he wants James White and Durbin to drink a glass of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of radiator fluid. It's an amazing thing. Drink this poison. Drink this poison. Isn't that what the Bible says? Drink this poison. <laughs> they had to call in the guards. I mean, the guy was ready to, I mean, James had to tell him to back up. The guy was in his face. He flipped out. Go watch that. It's an amazing thing. But you do see the heart of men who hate God. They hate, he, he hates God. So he's, he's making this a test. The drinking of antifreeze, the drinking of poison is a test in his mind. We're going to get to that in a moment. Look at what else they're going to do. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Brethren, these signs which Jesus speaks of here are consistent with those things that took place in the early church. There is nothing here that did not happen or take place in the early church. This atheist, drink poison, drink poison, drink poison, will Paul himself. Remember in Acts 28, when he's gathering the wood, the viper, the viper comes and latches on. And they're all going, oh, the, the pagans are going, oh, oh. Well, he made it out of the sea, but it looks like the poisonous snake's going to kill him. And they're all looking at him, waiting for him to die. And you know what? He shakes it off. Off he goes. And they're all going, wow. There's something unique here. This is not some kind of crazy, unfettered thing. This are the, these are the things that God used, amen, to declare to them his new covenant relationship with his people. As the church was growing, yes, brethren, Paul cast out devils. Yes. Let me give you the verse, Acts 16. There's so many of them, 16, 16 through 18. Yes, they spoke in tongues. I want to look at that one quickly. Look at Acts chapter 2. Yes, exactly as Jesus said. They, they did exactly what he said. Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> look at verse number 3. We know the Holy Spirit has just come. Verse number 3 says, 
And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as a fire, and sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is a miraculous thing. Okay. Honda, Honda, Honda. Yama, 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 yama. Kawasaki, Kawasaki, Kawasaki. That's not tongues. Never has been. Never will be. Tongues are defined perfectly here. Perfectly. It is a miraculous gift of God to speak in a foreign language. That's all it is. It was a purpose in a way in which God used to spread this gospel in their town, in their county, in their state, and all across the world. Yes, I believe we can still do it today. Yes. Okay. I made parcel. What would you call me? I'm like a leaky dispensationalist. Maybe I'm a leaky, uh, you know, cessationist. If God took, took Dean to India or took Wendy to China here, Lord willing, shortly, and she showed up on the shores of China and started speaking Mandarin without any school, without any study, without anything, Yes, God can still do that. Yes, he can. God can still heal the sick. God can still do these things. What begin to fade away, and we see it in Scripture, brethren, are those signs, the apostolic signs. Oh, I wish I had time. We don't have time. The apostolic signs did begin to fade. As God established the church, put the Scriptures together, as we had the word of God together, those begin to fade away because God's purposes for them was to establish the church, to grow the church, to, to, uh, to bring forth the gospel message. If God chooses down in India to do these things, then amen. Who are we? Who do we think we are? Now we have to judge them we have to look at it and go, okay, barking and puking like dogs is not of the Holy Spirit. But if God sends his gospel message through the mouth of one who can't speak this tongue and then speaks in that tongue, that is a miraculous thing. It really, really is. In fact, we talked about Paul being bitten by the poisonous snake in Acts 28. Eusebius, he's one of those old dead guys. Eusebius, when he wrote the history of the church, he tells of Papias, who tells of one justice, who drank deadly poison, and Pius said, and by the grace of the Lord, he suffered no harm. So yes, even historically, that has been done. I don't highly recommend it. Those things begin to fade, brethren. When an atheist rams a glass of, of uh, auto coolant in your face, Okay, you have to be able to defend it. You have to say, oh yes, yes they did do that. But that was for a purpose and a reason and God's glory, period. It's very simple. This isn't craziness. This isn't wild stuff. This is simply the truth. Now look, as we finish the last portion of it there, look at Mark 16, 19 through 20. As I said, this is like an old friend leaving. <laughs> Amen. We've been here together for so long. Look at verse 19 and 20. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, doing that imperative command. Now they didn't do it right away, you remember. In Acts, they were in Jerusalem, hung out there for a while, and persecution started. But they did go forth. You remember, Luke is a fast writer. He's in a hurry. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following, what's that last word? Amen. What a lovely way to have that stop. The preserved word of God here concludes with the Lord's ascension to the Father's right hand. His rightful place, as he reigns as king, as sovereign Lord, seated in the seat of power, 
at the right hand of his Father until he comes again. Amen? For his bride, the church. The last word in verse 20 is amen. What a fitting way for us to close <coughs> our text this morning. It means, brethren, to confirm. You ever been preaching along and somebody says, Amen! Well, you Baptists don't do it much anymore, but we used to. You are confirming. You are affirming to them that you agree with what is being said. Mark closes his gospel with, Amen. In other words, for the last almost three years, since December of 2017, we have been affirming. We are agreeing. We are saying, yes, Lord. Every last jot and tittle and word that's here, we agree. Amen? He's at the right hand of his father reigning. We are waiting in the church. We are waiting for his return. Amen? And as we gather this morning around the Lord's table, we are affirming. We are saying, Amen. We believe he died, he was buried, and he rose again from the dead, and he is coming faithfully for his bride, the church. Let's pray. Father, we we come before you this morning thanking you for this incredible gospel. Father, we thank you as you had led Mark by the Spirit of God as you carried him along to write all of these things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Reminded of that which we were and have been teaching our own children at home. Paul told Timothy to consider the scriptures, those things which you have learned from a child, that thing which is able to make thee wise unto salvation. Father, we have seen the Lord through the eyes of faith, through the Spirit of God, through the sword of the Spirit, his word. Father, we thank you for giving us a glimpse of the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect God-man. He who was perfect man, perfect God. He who did what only God could do. Again, confirming his deity over and over and over again. And yet, Father, we, see, we saw over and over again those religious leaders who hated his guts. It was just, it was palpable to see it. Here is God himself standing, their Savior, their Messiah, the one they were looking and waiting for, standing before them, preaching and teaching, and all they did was reject God the Father and his witness, God the Holy Spirit and his witness concerning Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ himself and his witness, and the witness of John the Baptist and the witness of the Word, all of it. Wow. Father, we saw your sovereign plan working its way out, using those people's instruments to bring forth the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You would leave that to no man. No way. No way. You, as the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, you're the one who gave up your own son. Father, you were the, the great high priest in all of it. You were the high priest who offered up your own sacrifice for the sins of your people. Father, we thank you for that. And now, Lord, as we turn our hearts and gather ourselves towards the Lord's Supper around the table, we thank you again for dying, for rising again from the grave, that you are even now, as Mark closed, seated at the right hand of God the Father in power and authority, soon to come, soon to return. And everybody, oh, when is that going to be? Well, I can assure you it'll be in God's perfect timing. It'll be when the last elect of God is saved, then he will come. 
And Father, we thank you for that now. We ask and pray these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.